I heard a story about a mother who was with her five-year-old daughter after Sunday Bible class, and she was talking about everything that she learned, and she held up to the daughter a picture of Jesus, and she said, sweetheart, what is his name? And tell me something he's done. And she stared at that, and she goes, I don't know his name, but I'm pretty sure he goes to our church. I like that. Names, names are really important. There, there's a lot of meaning and purpose wrapped up in names. In one sense, names actually have definitions and meanings. You may not know the actual definition of your name, but in times past, that was the very reason names were given. The name Moses means drawn because he was literally drawn out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. Abraham was given by God that name, and it means a father of, of a multitude. He wasn't a father of a multitude at the time, but God gave him a name confirming the promise that he had given to Abraham. Same thing with Sarah, that it means a princess, it means nobility. And then even Peter, Jesus gave him the name that it took him a while to live up to, but he gave him the name Rock, something that was sturdy and steadfast. Names have meanings entrenched within them. And names stand for reputation. And Proverbs reminds us in Proverbs 22 and verse 1, a good name is to be more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. We used to phrase, he made a name for himself. Name seems to represent the character of a person. And so we don't have a lot of boys among us named Ahab. We don't have a lot of daughters named Jezebel. Names represent more than their meaning. They represent a, a type of person. And so Abraham Lincoln, for instance, represents the idea of leadership and honesty, honest Abe, whereas we don't have a lot of Benedict Arnolds. That name seems to represent deceit and, and carelessness. Names stand for the inward integrity of a person. And the names stand for authority. There's a question asked of Jesus in Matthew 21 when it says, When he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority? Are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Well, there's your question, isn't it? And that's a great question. Even though there was deceit in their minds, it wasn't an honest question. It's still a great question. Who gave you that authority? Who gave you the right to do the things that you were doing? I think a lot of churches need to ask this today. Why, why are we doing what we're doing, and who gave us the right to do that in the first place? Because there are certain names that carry with them a certain weight or role of responsibility. For instance, I could show up to the White House door and say, I need to see the president. And they would say, on whose authority? And I would say, mine, mine authority. I have a lot to talk with them about. I'm not getting past that gate. However, if I were to arrive at their front doors and say, the, the president of the United States has invited me here, and I show them the seal with his name, that signature on it, it literally opens up doors. Now, Here's where we're going today, and hopefully this will be a great, a great initiation, if you will. We're going to start to our morning, our focus in this study. As the name above all names, the name of God carries all of that, carries deep meaning, carries the richest definition of character and goodness and quality. It is a name above all names. It is a name of full authority. Psalm 111, verse 9, He sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. Or Psalm 8, verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. You have set Your glory above the heavens. I love the imagery of that psalm. Or even Matthew 6, verse 9, Jesus in the model prayer, Pray them this way, our Father in heaven, Hallowed, hallowed be your name, holy, set apart, unlike any name that exists. Here's what's fascinating about the name of God. It's not just that he has a name, or that God has a name, like you and I have a name. Since God is the one who's always been around, he gets to choose his name, right? You didn't choose your name, or if you did, you chose some process of doing so. But most of us didn't really have a say in that matter. The name was given to us. Even the first man on the planet was given a name. But no one gave God his name, which means God chose of all things to call himself to reveal himself to us in a special way. I think that's important. We need to realize that. Of all the things God could identify himself as, there are several names he chose. One of the most common in the Old Testament is, is the name Elohim, which is his God creator, the preserver, the cre the, the one who began all things, the initiator, the one who is mighty and strong. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, then God created and the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So Elohim is one we find all throughout the Old Testament. There's the name El Shaddai, God Almighty, or the all-sufficient God, mentioned in Genesis 17 and verse 1. 
there's the personal name of God. You think of what he said to, to Moses in that burning bush. I am the I am. Tell them the I am has sent you. That I am is Jehovah. And it's attached with several qualities. Jehovah Rophe, we just sang this in our in our uh, annual singing a few weeks ago. It means the Lord who heals, the Lord who heals his people. Jehovah Jireh, there on, on the top of, of Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac. And it was Abraham who used this word saying, the Lord will provide. He will provide the sacrifice, and that is his name. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner in Exodus 17 and verse 15. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd in Psalm 23 and verse 1. We, we, we get the idea that God has chosen to reveal himself in a lot of different ways to his people. Each name distinct, each name representing and illustrating a part of his character or his will, what it is he desires to do. It's fascinating looking on the board. The personal name of God, the I am Jehovah, was so precious to the people of God that they wouldn't speak it. They wouldn't speak that name, Jehovah. In fact, only one time out of the year, the high priest would say it. He would say it during the the atonement ceremony. So, as centuries passed, they forgot how to pronounce that name. There's a a really important reason why. There in in, in Exodus 20, verse 7, it's very likely the reason the name lost its, its, its understanding, its pronunciation or as we say here, the pronunciation. Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. They're rounding out commandments about God in the Ten Commandments is this, this solid statement that you and I know, in fact, we may not be able to list all of the Ten Commandments, and we might not have been able to put that one in its order, but we know when we hear someone taking the Lord's name in an irreverent manner today, there's something that rubs us wrong about that. Almost like someone taking their fingers down a, a chalkboard, or someone scraping metal, or you hear someone punking on their, their, their teeth with a silver, whatever it is that bugs you and gets under your skin when you hear it. When we hear someone using the name of the Lord, God's people, there's something unnerving about that, and it's entrenched in this command. God said something a long time ago about how his name is to be used or not used. The word vain here is is described this way. It says the word vain describes that which is empty, insincere, frivolous. The commandment then lays down that the name of God must never be used in an empty, frivolous, or insincere way. Or another one said, that using his name in a thoughtless, irreverent, empty, or hypocritical way, using it casually or carelessly or just outright blasphemously. I'm just using the name of Lord however it is that I wish. Now, at least just initially at this point, Leviticus 24 confirms what it is that, that was said in, in, in verse 7 when it says, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. It's not that God made a suggestion. Hey, when you use my name, I want you to say it correctly. Have you ever so, know someone that way that you just can't say their name correctly? And every time you try to say their name, you get it wrong. I went to dinner with a lady this past week, and it was spelled N-I-N-A. It is not Nina. It was Nina. I said Nina all week long. And I got corrected all week long. You ever know someone that way? Really particular about the name? That's not what God is saying here. I want you to pronounce it correctly. Which is What he is instilling is, I am a holy God, and I will be treated as holy. And if you choose to disregard who I am by how I am known, it will come with some severe consequences. This is much more than protecting his name. It's about protecting his integrity and his holiness among the people. And we need to catch that. So there's some don'ts with this that come right off the page about caring for and respecting the name of the, of the Lord. Number one, don't make promises that you don't intend to keep. Don't use God's name to make promises that you don't intend to keep. And so in Matthew 5 and 33, when Jesus says again, you've heard it that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the, his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one here white or black. Like what you say simply be yes or no. 
Anything more than this comes from evil. Here he's saying there, it's not that he is saying you can never make a promise before God or in the presence of God or invoking God's name because I'm looking at a lot of people who did that. We stood before our mates and a preacher and we made a, an oath. We made a promise, a covenant agreement in the presence of God to love and care and serve for the other person until, until death do we part. And so it's not saying you can't make those kind of promises. What Jesus is saying is you don't invoke the name of God or anything holy or righteous. In fact, everything on that screen has to do with God, whether it's God the creator or God as, as king or God over all, right, the, heaven and earth. What Jesus is saying is the people of God need to be people of integrity who keep their word, who do what is right. Don't make promises you keep, can't keep. Just do what you say. Don't make an oath. We see how it's taking the name of the Lord in vain is, is that we ought to avoid using God's name to express our shock or dismay. And that's perhaps it's the largest way the, the name of the Lord is used today. In Ecclesiastes 5, beginning of verse 1, he says, Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. Notice, for God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. What, what, what an amazing reverential passage there. Remember who you are. Remember where you are. Remember where you stand. Remember where God sits enthroned in heaven. The throwaway word, to use God's name carelessly, irreverently. And I think for some of us here, we, we understand that. We understand that. But maybe just a few reminders for us that even things throw away, throw away. Sometimes the texting of OMG in our minds, in our minds, we're going somewhere else, and we don't realize I can be awful misleading with how it is I am representing or not representing the name of God. If I'm saying TGIF, thank God it's Friday, then I'd better be thanking the Lord that it is Friday and not using that as a casual, as a casual way, as a casual term. If I say thank God that person's okay, th thank God they didn't get in that accident, I had better be thanking God. Because what Solomon reminds us is, now look, he sits on the throne, and you stand down here on heaven, or on earth, on earth. You don't have a right to use that name carelessly to express emotion or shock or dismay. Be careful with the name of God, how you use that name. We are not to use the Lord's name to curse another human being. It would be amazing if we would ever do so. Who in their right mind would use God's name, that holy and precious name and that gifted tongue to hurt or to wound another? But James says that with our tongues we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. To use this tongue that God has given to us or to claim in any sense of the word that what I am doing is right and righteous, I'm cutting down a brother or sister in the name of God, is to blaspheme, is to disdain and to distort the gift of the tongue and the gift of words and the glory of God by doing so. In fact, in your Bibles, you can leave Exodus 20. Let's go to Ephesians 5. I want you to notice of I want you to notice of the, the progression of thought in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Okay, you got the first part. Follow God, be like God, walk in love just like Jesus loved us. Look at verse 3. What's that look like? But immorality or impurity or greed must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must not be filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Did you notice that flow? I want you to walk like God walks, and I want you to walk in love and follow the way that Christ modeled that for you. He left heaven. He came to earth. He put himself on the cross for your best interest. So follow him. What's that mean? That you're not at all going to walk in the path of things that are wrong. You're walking like Jesus and the things that are right, that honors God. What's involved with that? Your lips, your words, the things that you say, 
and choose to say, the way you talk about other people, James 3 would say, how dare we cut down another person simply by the fact that they were made in the image of God. Another person's worth and value is not found in the things that they vote for or in the things that they stand for, but simply because our God made them. Our God made them. Colonel Sanders, the man who came up with KFC, said that when he became a Christian, it cost him half his vocabulary. I believe it. Something's got to change along the way. We can't claim to walk with God. We can't claim to be a person of God if we use that God-given tongue to abuse our fellow man, our neighbors made in the image of God. And that really takes us to our last one. We're not to take God's name or to use God's name to cover a worldly life. That is to, to claim to walk with God, to claim to be a child of God, where everything about my life is evident that that's not at all what is taking place. And so Paul says in Titus 1 and verse 16 that there are some who profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. That there are some who are so quick to claim that they love God, that they are a Christian, and that God, Christ means everything to them on Sunday morning and everything on Facebook on Sunday morning is about God but then Monday takes place and they're a completely different person the mask is off and reality is revealed do you remember last week Ricky preached on Nathan do you remember what Nathan said to David in the midst of all of his sin which he had done and not just the sin against Bathsheba and against Uriah and against the nation he said because of what you have done you have given cause for the enemies of God to blaspheme his Name. You remember that? That if I'm going to claim to be a Christian, claim to be a child of God, there's a walk associated with that name. Have you ever seen that when you're driving down the highway? There's that sign on the back of the truck that says, tell me how I'm doing, and it has a number on there. You don't want that on your car unless you're driving a certain way or you don't care what your boss thinks about your driving, right? How many of us would put that on there? Tell my wife how I'm driving. Here's her number. I think for a minute. There's a story about Alexander the Great. And a soldier was brought to him who was rebellious and careless, causing, causing great harm amongst the ranks. And he said, soldier, what's your name? He said, well, my name is Alexander. He said, you either need to change your name or change your conduct. We either need to change our name or change our conduct, brethren. Don't claim to be a child of God while living like the world. Don't, change, don't claim to be bought by the blood of Jesus, walking with the Lamb, while tearing down others with hate and disdain in our path. Either change our name or change our conduct. We can't use Christ, God, holy names as of a shield, veiling people from the reality of the way we live. Here's why it really matters. There's two sad statements given to us in the Old Testament. Psalm 74 verse 18 says, Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Hear that name. The enemies of God, those who are foolish, are those who use God's name in a way that brings such shame and disgrace, not understanding the name they use. And in Isaiah 52 verse 5 says, Now therefore, what, what do I have here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause, Against the Lord declares, or again the Lord declares, those who rule over them how, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Those who align themselves as enemies with God use his name irreverently. And here's the big crux, why all this matters, why it matters to us today. How I use God's name is but a mere reflection of how it is I see God in my heart. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 12 and in Matthew 15 that everything we say, everything that flows out of our lips, first originates down within our heart. And so if I'm casual with God or indifferent with God in my lips, it's but a mere illustration. Just but small evidence and fruit of the fact that I really don't have a lot of reverence or care for God deep down in my heart. And the bigger reason why all this matters for you and I today is that it's not just that the name of God represents God for who he is. That's really important. But it represents us. Daniel 9 verse 19, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God. 
because your city and your people are called by your name. The people of God are known by a name, and it is his name. That was then. For you and I today, it sounds like this. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, Christian, Christ follower, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. It's who we are. That name is our identity. That name, brethren, represents what took place at the cross. Christian means of Christ, purchased and bought by Christ. And to take that precious name, which means everything about who we are and what we're trying to do, and to disdain it not only harms His glory, but, brethren, it makes all that we are and are seeking to do futile. God said to Moses in Exodus 3 and verse 15, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. That, that law, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, was not designed to say, Hey, stop using my name. Don't use my name. The law was designed to say, I have a special name and you need to keep it special. My name is holy and you need to, you need to fear it and revere it. What it was intended to do is to say, this is who I am, and I want you to see me as I am and reflect me for who I am in the world. In fact, one author said it this way, nothing above me and your thoughts and affections and your words or actions. No carved substitutes that steal away your thoughts and affections and words and actions. For I am jealous to have all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. So don't treat me. My name as empty, futile, pointless, trivial, inconsequential, insignificant. Don't let your words be empty of my truth. Don't let your hearts be empty of your affections. Revere me. Love me. Trust me. Treasure me. Satisfy your heart with me. That's the call of what this is. I want you to see me for who I am. And I want you to reflect that as you speak of me and carry forth my name. And so let's talk about how we use that precious name, how we use that glorious name, the Lord. And we're going to do so in many ways this morning. And maybe this will give a second thought. Men, as we lead in prayer and we get to before the entire congregation with such reverence and holiness and honor to use that name, those who will reside at the table and will take us to talk about that worthy lamb. Those who will lead us in song, lifting up that beautiful name. What an honor. Let's think about the ways we get to use that name and should use that name. First of which is to acknowledge his authority. Luke 10 and verse 17, Jesus said that the 72 had returned rejoicing, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Look, in your name. In your name. In whose name? In Jesus' name. The demon surrendered to Jesus' name. Jesus said in Matthew 20 and verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? Christ has the power to cast out demons. Christ has the power to save the sin-stricken soul. Acts 4 and verse 12, Then there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Saved how? Only through the power, the authority, the will of King Jesus. Colossians 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. How do I use his name to acknowledge I am here and I am saved because of him? And we need to remember that. I might have hit that home button on my GPS, but the only reason I'm going home is the grace of God. It's the grace of Jesus. I will only be there because of him. And today, no matter where you are, maybe you're at a bad place and you've come to a good place at a good time. Or maybe I'm doing great today. You praise the God, I'm doing a lot better than I have been, and I'm growing and I'm learning that we are a people who take what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. I am what I am by the grace of God. 
I've come this far. I've grown this this much. I can say that I stand today because of his, his grace, his authority, his power. We use the name of God to acknowledge him as our blesser, as we ought to. And we just did that so beautifully in song. James 1 and verse 17, to every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Now let me ask you a question. Based off that verse, would it be a misinterpretation to say every good thing you get this next week, you can turn around and thank God for? Is that a misapplication of that verse? I don't think so. Can you imagine? Every good thing, every good thing piles up after a while, doesn't it? I had all, I had, a, I had a wonderful day at work, and God gave me that work. And it was beautiful. It's going to rain, Lord willing. I'll talk about it here. It's going to rain. Elijah prayed, and the rain is going to fall again here in Dallas. And we can give thanks. Kids are healthy. My, my spouse is healthy. I had a wonderful day at worship. What a wonderful home. My clothes fit and, and the shoes are on and I have blessings all around. I just have a lot to give thanks for. And I'm going to give thanks to where it is. And imagine if we did that. Imagine if, again, because again, this is not just me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for what you've given to me. But what if people asked you, hey, how are you doing today? And instead of saying, great, I'm doing great. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. It's going to throw them off a little bit. But what you're trying to do is I just want you to realize that where I am today whether if I'm good or bad, or I am where I am by the grace of God, and I want to point all credit and glory to him. And I'm going to evoke his name, to use his name as the giver of all that's good. We can use God's name to acknowledge his, his will and his sovereignty, and we do this. We just did it a minute ago, and we do this all the time. Now, here's the thing. This is not tradition. This is not, as some people would say, a Church of Christ way of talking, as if there is such a thing. And there is. <laughs> There's only so, so many people who know what God Guard Direct means um, <laughs> among the world. There's only so many people who know that a gospel meeting isn't a secret meeting among spiritual elite in a small closet. There, there's some things we say that not a lot of people know. But this next one is not something that we have come up with, our tradition. Because James says, you, you don't know what your life is going to be tomorrow. You're just a vapor. You're just a breath that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And so instead, when you're making your plans, when you're looking forward, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this or that. Now, again, it's not a throwaway word. And sometimes we mean it that way. It's kind of guide, guard, direct. We kind of throw it out there, not really knowing what it means. Get the preacher ready to recollection. We, we, we throw that out without really thinking about what it means. And so if I say, Lord willing, that's not like saying in Jesus' name, amen. Right? And I don't really know what all that implies. Lord willing means if it is the plan and will of God and it aligns with his purpose, this will take place. That's what I'm saying. I'm acknowledging I'm not really in control tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to rain, right? Apple has been wrong before. It may be wrong again when I looked at my phone and it's not going to rain. So if it's God's plan and God's will, God's sovereign over all, I'm acknowledging today I'm not in control and I know the one who is. And so if it's his will, it'll rain. There will be a tomorrow and it will rain tomorrow. And all that will happen will be in his hands and by his plan. That will sound strange among our friends, but it will reorient our thinking, brother, realign our thinking, if we would just say that more often. If it's a plan of God and the will of God, tomorrow we will, and we fill it in. If it's a plan of God and the will of God, King Jesus will return, or we'll go forward, and we can use his name powerfully by doing so. We are to use the name of God to confess our faith. Matthew 10, verse 32, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge. I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. What a beautiful thought. I may not have a thousand friends on Facebook. I may not be known by a lot of people in this world. But if I claim and express with absolute sincerity, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then he has taken my name and has spoken it to the Father. Can't tell you what that means. God knows my name, not just because he created me, but because Jesus confirmed me. And I'm going to do that. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you a Christian? Do you, do you go to church somewhere? I am the I am. I believe. 
We can use the name of God to address in prayer, obviously, as we've done today, but that's one of the, the, the most powerful ways. That's one of the most clearest ways we, we will demonstrate our faith in God is when we pray to him. And so Jesus said in John 14, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And again, that's what I'm acknowledging. I'm really acknowledging point one and point three and point five when I'm saying point four. I believe in you, and so I'm praying to you, and I believe that you are and that you listen and that you will do what you are purposing to do in your time, that you can do it and that you will do it. That's a lot, isn't it? That in one moment, in one moment, and we're going to have an exercise of that in about three minutes when someone comes up here. In that moment, we are declaring to God and demonstrating to ourselves the depth of our faith. I believe that you are, and you're listening right now, right now to what we're saying. And I believe that you are empowered to do whatever it is. If there's a sickness or an illness, you would speak it, and earth must obey. And everything must submit to your voice. And I believe that. And so I believe as I bring these petitions or thanksgivings that you are going to receive them, you can do it. And if it is your will and your plan, that it will go forward. That's faith. That's real faith. Get ready. We're about to do that. And then, of course, we can praise. Praise the name of the Lord. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Why we've gathered today through Jesus, through him. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. Thank the Lord, praise the Lord, honor the Lord to his name. Fellas, you remember when you found your sweetheart? It was a beautiful thing you'd ever seen. First thing you said to her, what's your name? If she didn't give it to you, you've lost. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. There's a lot of power when she gives you that name. So, oh, now that she's given you the name, there's an invitation. An invitation for a conversation. An invitation for things to get a little closer and more personal. But you also remember, men and even wives, when you were in that ceremony and you were giving each other your promises and your words, your wives, men, gave you probably one of the greatest honors they could when they chose to wear your name. They said, I'm going to give up the name for which I was born and given, and I am choosing to accept yours as mine. And for hereforth until the day that I die, I will be known and associated and forever intimately, intimately connected to your identity. I am yours. There's a power when the name is given. The psalmist says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. It's not a shrinking shack. It's not an unstable house. With the name of the Lord is strength. Today, God has given to us his name. He's given his name. And so whether we are singing that name, or praying that name, or reading that name. Let's do the best we can in our hearts as we listen and as we speak to just be a people who honor that in return. Let's honor that name. And as we leave from here, as we sing in one of our hymns, take the name of Jesus with you. You honor something great. You represent something mighty. Live in a way that would bring honor and glory to that wonderful name. So let's do that now. We're going to stand and have a prayer and have a verse of a final song and head to our classes. If you need help, we'd love to help you get to those classes. Let's get that faith. Let's demonstrate that faith as we have that prayer. Let's stand and have that prayer, please. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com questions at thebibleway.com we'd love to have you in person come if you can but thank you for connecting with us